Good afternoon. I'm uh, John Walters, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. I want to welcome everybody um, to Hudson. Um, this is a, uh, a terrific occasion, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to welcome former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison here. Um, he has been uh, a leader on the forefront, and I also wanted to um, just express our particular appreciation to Australia, uh, America has many allies. I don't think there's any ally, frankly, closer than Australia. Uh, they have bled with us. They have uh, been patient with us at times when we have not been helpful, and they are now on the front lines. Um, there's an American comedian who does a routine about foreigners' attitudes toward, uh, hostile attitudes toward Americans, but he says of Australians, they like Americans so much you have to wonder about their judgment. Uh, so uh, um, uh, I think that's a, that's a, that may be a true expression of friendship, and I hope my spouse has the same attitude toward me, frankly. But um, today, we, fe we face the common thread of a, of a, of a, of a superpower in, in making or on the brink of being a peer competitor of the United States. And uh, um, Australia has led on the front lines of defending freedom in the neighborhood of the Chinese communist threat. They took the lead under uh, Prime Minister Morrison and, um, and stood up to the Chinese who were already trying to break down our relationships and try to co-opt uh, powers by the uh, threat of, of coercion in various forms, uh, economic, political, and of course military. Um, his government has stood and stood strongly uh, working to strengthen the relationship between the United States and, and Britain under the AUKUS agreement and to, and to put teeth into deterrence, which is the only way deterrence works in the world, as he knows. So it's my honor to welcome him here. Um, uh, my colleague, Miles Yu, who is senior fellow and, and the director of our China Center, is going to do a proper introduction of the prime minister. But I just wanted to say welcome. I want to say thank you for all you've done for the United States and for what your country has done over many years and what you're on the front line doing today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, coming. Uh, it is a very rainy Washington day, but the spirit here is always obviously very high. Uh, my name is Miles Yu. I'm a senior fellow and uh, um, director of the China Center at the Hudson uh, Institute. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, during the Thanksgiving um, holiday, uh, a friend of mine were chatting, and he asked me what's, uh, what I was up to. I said, uh, I'm going to, among many things, host a, a very famous Australian at Hudson. He said, uh, who might that be? I said, well, take a guess. He's very Australian. He's very famous. He's beloved by Australians and Americans. And uh, without the blink of an eye, he said, uh, Mel Gibson. <laughs> uh, so uh, I said, no, Scott Morrison. He paused for a while. So Scott Morrison, was that the fellow who fought at the, uh, in the Battle of uh, Gallipoli? I said, no, that's a Mel Gibson. Um, <laughs> You know, Mel Gibson is Australian, and he became famous uh, by starring in the movie Gallipoli, which obviously was a battle uh, in World War I. Um, Scott Morrison, obviously, is not a soldier in the battle of bygone years. He is a general, an admiral, in the uh, uh, current uh, battle for a much larger cause, um, the cause of um, defending global order and uh, global freedom and democracy. And uh, obviously, um, he's been a staunch uh, um, ally of the United States, and his, he led his government with great distinction. So um, before I um, introduce him officially, I'd like to give uh, several, uh, a couple of house rules today. So basically, um, um, I'm going to make our, our introduction remarks, and uh, uh, Scott will um, uh, make his remarks. And then after that, we have uh, just a few minutes of one-on-one. -on -one. I'll ask him questions. Um, um, and then uh, will be the overall um, Q&A from the audience. Now, we have decided uh, uh, you're going to ask questions uh, to an email address, and I think you all get, get that address. And, and so I'll just uh, look at the, the questions. And if you don't, do not have that address, and our staff, for, our staff um, uh, will help you with that. So um, with that, um, um, and uh, um, 
I'm going to introduce our honor guest today um, as Prime Minister of Australia from 2018 to 2022. Scott Morrison successfully led his nation through the most difficult and significant challenges Australia had faced since the Great Depression and World War II. Under Mr. Morrison's national leadership, Australia had the third lowest COVID fatality rate in the OECD. And an economic response that enabled Australia to outperform all G7 and most OECD nations in both employment and economic growth. On the international stage, Mr. Morrison was known for his leadership in uh, countering an increasingly assertive China in the Indo-Pacific region. Mr. Morrison pursued this with an, uh, as an architect of the Quad Dialogue with the United States, India, and Japan. Under his leadership, the landmark AUKUS Trilateral Defense Agreement between the United States, Australia, and Great Britain was established. Also under his leadership, Australia restored its defense spending to more than 2% of GDP. In 2020, Mr. Morrison was made Chief Commander of the Legion of Merit by the President of the United States for leadership in addressing global challenges. He is also recipient of the Jerusalem Prize by the World Zionist Organization in 2019 for services in the Australia-Israeli Australia relationship and the inaugural Grotius Prize by UK Policy Exchange in 2021 for his work and support of the international rules-based order. Personally, I would also hold him responsible for my newest addiction, which is Australian wine. Uh, China uh, banned um, import of wine from Australia because Mr. Morrison moderately suggested to the Chinese that they should allow international uh, inquiry into the origin of COVID. Um, and I really like Australian wine. I'm just lucky enough uh, that the Chinese government has not banned a very nasty Vegemite. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Honorable uh, Mr. Scott Morrison. Scott. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Miles. It was uh, quite unique. I haven't had one quite like that before. And it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here in Washington. Mr. President, thank you very much for your um, kind words as well, um, not just to me personally, but also about the relationship between Australia and the United States. It is a very unique relationship and it is uh, very dear to the hearts, I know, of both Australians and, and, and those in the United States. And we've seen that demonstrated on so many occasions. Uh, when uh, Ambassador Hockey was here, he initiated uh, the, uh, the mateship program, um, recognising 100 years of uh, uh, the Americans and Australians um, standing together in so many conflicts over such a long period of time and uh, that extends and it continues and I'd say that the relationship that uh, we're, we're able to forge um, goes beyond politics, goes beyond partisanship and uh, I hope that will always be the case and, and I'm very confident that it will be. Can I acknowledge also some colleagues who are here with me today? I see John Lee's here today which is a, who is a, who was a, a Hudson, uh, part of the Hudson family. Uh, John worked for uh, Foreign Minister um, Bishop um, and I, he and I knew each other back then and when I was a minister in, in uh, those governments in Australia. Uh, ben Morton, who's a former colleague of mine in, in my own government and Special Minister of State in Australia, is here with us. Ambassador Hisham from um, Egypt is here with me, a dear friend who, and we work together on uh, the Worldwide Support for Development program and, and uh, it's great to see him here as well and to representatives of the Australian Embassy here in Washington. Thanks for the great work that you do uh, here in the United States. I was the beneficiary of that as a Prime Minister, as a Treasurer, as, a, as an Immigration Minister yeah. and, and even as a Social Services Minister um, over the periods of time of our government. But uh, I'm here in Washington uh, at the moment to be here for the uh, IDU conference uh, here in Washington. But uh, the opportunity extended itself having taken on uh, the, uh, the role here at uh, Hudson as a member of the Strategic Advisory Board of the China Centre. And uh, I want to thank Miles um, for his work as part of that centre and Hudson more broadly. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my dear friend uh, Mike Pompeo for the, for the invitation. 
Mike and I worked closely together when he was Secretary of State and it's an, indeed an honour to join him in the work that he is doing here at Hudson and more broadly. Uh, Mike and I share many, many interests um, right across the spectrum and, uh, and I wish him well in that role. China has changed. The world has woken up to this and Australia has been uh, on the front line of the grey zone in in dealing with these challenges. It was only a couple of months ago, it was written in The Economist. At home, Mr Xi makes all the big calls with a fierce machinery of repression enforcing his will. Abroad, he seeks to fashion a global order more congenial for autocrats. To this end, China takes a twin-track approach. It works to co-op international bodies and redefine the principles that underpin them. Bilaterally, it recruits countries as supporters. Its economic heft helps turn poorer ones into clients. Its unsqueamishness about abuses lets it woo despots. And its own rise is an example to countries discontented with American-led status quo. Mr Xi's aim is not to make other countries more like China, but to protect China's interests and to establish a norm that no sovereign government need bow to anyone else's definition of human rights. Now, that's what was written in The Economist just a couple of months ago. It's not news to Australia. It's certainly not news to me. I was part of and was very proud to lead a government that understood that and knew that Australia needed to stand tall in what I'd describe. Here we are in Washington with what I'd call a Hamiltonian defiance because it was Alexander Hamilton who said the nation which can prefer disgrace to danger is prepared for a master and deserves one. Australia knows no such master. And I'm very proud of the fact um, that we acted in accordance with that defiant trend. We did call out the Chinese government's coercive behaviour towards Australia. And in response, we were the subject of significant grey zone tactics, most significantly the imposition of what we believe are very unlawful trade sanctions and bans, uh, which are intended to punish Australia. The grievance that China identified with Australia was set out in a statement that was actually released by the Chinese embassy in Australia to the media. And it's what we call the 14 points. These were China's grievances with my government and the coalition government that I was part of. Firstly, that we were applying Australian foreign investment laws to disallow PRC sourced investment in critical Australian assets and infrastructure. Secondly, that we were taking lawful decisions to prevent Huawei and ZTE from participating in the build of Australia's 5G network on security grounds. Thirdly, that we had passed laws that protected Australia from foreign interference in our domestic institutions, including our universities and in our political affairs. Fourthly, that we were exercising control over the conduct of research and scientific partnerships on projects sensitive to Australia's national security interests. Fifthly, that we called for an independent inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. That we, sixthly, provided national statements to the UN on Xinjiang, on Hong Kong and on Taiwan. That we provided national statements on the application of UNCLOS in the South China Sea. That we supported statements of our allies on similar issues relating to the PRC in the United Nations that we prevented subnational governments in Australia from entering into agreements with other nations that were inconsistent with national foreign policy settings. So when the Australian federal government said no, that we were not going to allow subsidiary governments in Australia to say yes, because that would be con contradictory to Australia's national interest. That we tenthly funded well-respected national foreign policy think tanks that had expressed criticisms of the PRC, that we used search and seizure powers lawfully to enforce our foreign interference and espionage laws, 
Eleventhly, we used, sorry, twelfthly, we called out cyber attacks from highly sophisticated state-based actors that we permitted freedom of speech by members of parliament on issues relating to the PRC in our national parliament and other places. And finally, that we allowed a free media in Australia to independently report on issues relating to the PRC. That was the articulation of the Chinese government's grievance with my government. Now, no respecting, self-respecting representative democracy that favours freedom could ever concede on any of those points. And I recall at the G7 I attended in Carbis Bay, reading that list to fellow leaders to remind them of what was at stake and what Australia was facing and that they may soon one day face themselves. And for those who think there is some sort of halfway point of conciliation on these points, they must define what are the seven they're giving up. I can't define them and never would. And as a result, to find some middle path on that relationship, which requires the concession on any of those points, must be unthinkable to any reasonably minded Australian or anyone who is in favour of a world order that favours freedom. We took practical steps with our allies and partners, the Quad, the AUKUS arrangements and the many other measures that were the subject of grievance were all designed to ensure that Australia was in a position to hold its ground and to stand its ground. We called this out when many others actually were remaining silent on the points that I have noted and caused grievance. The Chinese government assumption that Australia would simply roll over so as not to offend them when faced with coercion proved to be significantly misplaced because our stand strengthened others. Our actions, together with our partners, and particularly the United States and Japan, achieved the necessary pushback to counterbalance Chinese assertiveness globally and in the Pacific region. But I would add this caution. We may have seen a change of tactics more recently, and I welcome the fact that uh, President Xi has met with Prime Minister Albanese. I welcome that outcome, but I wouldn't want to mistake that as being a change of direction or a change of strategy. I would note it is a change of tactic and China's intent has not changed. So let's quickly reflect on the change that has taken place in China. Elizabeth Economy wrote a great piece for the Council of Foreign Relations where she referred to Xi's new Chinese state as the third revolution. And she historically makes the point that President Xi very much breaks with the past. He was the first leader not nominated by Deng Xiaoping. But he was also the leader that brought to an end Deng's reform and opening agenda and established a new model which was based on a very strong nationalism, drawing especially on historical grievances um, and reviving aspiration, Chinese aspiration. The references to the century of humiliation from 1849 to 1949, a common theme with any Chinese diplomat that you might have engaged with, um, particularly under Xi's presidency. There was a renewed and genuine commitment to the ideology of socialism with Chinese characteristics, as it's referred to. And I believe that commitment is real and the belief is real and it is passionate and it drives the Chinese agenda very strongly. There has been a renovation and escalation of state control. And this has particularly been done to preserve the party, the Chinese Communist Party, as the instrument to protect ideological adherence in China. And there is, of course, old-fashioned populism. President Xi is a very effective politician. He is a charismatic politician who has demonstrated a unique ability to connect with the Chinese people and that should not be underestimated. Domestically, state control and centralisation are part of protecting national security and to establish and defend their objective of self-sufficiency. We have seen the re-emergence of a, a very passionate economic statism, the renovating of SOEs, centrality to economic planning in China, and the controlling the flow of capital ideas in and out of the country. We have seen moves 
uh, to ensure supply chain security and independence, particularly in critical technologies, rare earths, critical minerals. Common prosperity has been a big objective of Xi's regime. And no one knows that better than Jack Ma and the many others uh, throughout the Chinese economy who have done incredibly well and in the name of equality have been facing a very different response from this Chinese president to those who preceded him. And there is, of course, the objective domestically, and I highlight this as a domestic agenda, that President Xi set out very clearly that he wants China to be in a position to have the capacity to fight and win wars. They are his own objectives, and to be able to project force. Internationally, we've seen a Chinese government that has been involved in, I think, four key areas. The first is to align, and this is all about protecting and projecting China's place in the world to ensure they can never again be humiliated. And I underscore this. This is the driving motivation, both at a political level and at a societal level, that they will never face again a period of humiliation as they've described it. And this is very much the fuel in the tank of what drives much of the agenda. And so there is an alignment, and I wouldn't call it a partnership, but an alignment with other autocratic states, in particular Russia, the No Limits Partnership. It's not necessarily a meeting of minds with these other autocratic states as it is a shared interest and a convenient one at that. There is the objective of enlisting many other nations to their cause through championing developing country success. There are 60 nations, at my last reckoning, uh, including in Europe, who are signed up to the BRI initiative. It's 70% of the world's population and 55% of the world's GDP. There is the coercion of countries like Australia or Lithuania or others where it's intended to intimidate and punish those countries who seek to frustrate China's approach and agenda. And finally, there is the role they play in seeking to influence the international rules-based order and to modify the global rules based on an order that would better suit Chinese interests. This is what's going on, but there are vulnerabilities to this. And I think there have been some real pushback in recent times as the world has woken up. Domestically, what we've seen is the economic slowdown. Growth is down from 9.5% or thereabouts in 2011, and the IMF believes that'll be around 3.2% this year. Youth unemployment reportedly at 18%. The property sector meltdown is wiping out, for many, middle-class wealth. The Chinese property sector accounts for around 30 to 35 per cent of total credit in their financial system and around a quarter of the Chinese economy. The slowdown in credit growth is partly responsible for the property sector collapse, but it will have impacts. There is significantly re reduced sales, projects are not completing, and we've also seen, seen the reduction in land sales within China, which is further undermining local government bonds relying on such sales. The fertility rate has fallen to levels similar to here in the United States, but there is not the counterbalancing impact of immigration to support population growth that we see in Western countries. And productivity has declined, and I'd say that is in part significantly due to the elevation of the status of SOEs again within the Chinese economic model, which means that Chinese firms, particularly SOEs, have a productivity performance which is around about only a third of what is achieved by US private firms. There is rising inequality. Uh, Carl Minzner, in his book, End of an Era, refers culturally to a, a phrase, and others may assist me with the pronunciation, but uh, diosi, or diosi, I think it's referred to, D-I-A-O-S-I. And it's a self-mocking term for youth unable to purchase a home, obtain well-paying jobs, and struggle for opportunities. There's a lot that's said about the ability and difficulty in Western countries of young people being able to buy a home. And home ownership is one of the most important elements, particularly in a Western um, society and, and in a, in a market-based economy. Similar frustrations are being expressed within China today. Environmental degradation is playing its role in China, with around a fifth of China's rivers so polluted that water quality is too toxic for physical contact and there are similar challenges when it comes to air quality and land degradation across 
uh, the Chinese landscape. COVID zero is crushing the Chinese economy and we're seeing it crush the spirit of the Chinese people. Now, growth is estimated it could be above 55 to 6% where these restraints were not in place, but as I've mentioned before, that's down to 3.2%. So the cost is significant. Road freight is down a third, domestic flights are down almost by half. And we are starting to see again social unrest despite the crackdown and despite the centralisation of authority. There is unrest and there is defiance. And not just in Hong Kong, but we read of the 27-year-old bartender in Shanghai who called for Xi to go and no one's heard from him again. Globally, there's been pushback. I think that in part deals with a China that... Chinese government that doesn't really understand the West. It's often talked about how the West needs to understand China better, but I would argue that as China continues to withdraw and internalise, that their understanding of the West is also not complete. There is an assume, assumption that the West will only operate in its economic interests and that its national interests um, do not extend beyond its economic interests, and as a result, the West can be easily bought off. Now, there are some Western democracies which might be giving that view some encouragement. Um, but Australia is not one of them. And I don't believe the United States is either. And I think Japan has demonstrated that as well. And the other Quad member in India, I think, has taken a very strong position. Our interest in these societies goes well beyond those of our economy. There is a global awareness. Deng's approach of hiding in plain sight, well, I think that has changed also. And the world has become a lot more wary. There is, has been the non-accountability for the COVID virus that emanated from China and has devastated the world. And I will never resile from ever calling on the Chinese government to be subject to an inquiry as to how COVID began. Diplomatic overreach through wolf warrior diplomacy has been pulled back because its offensive nature was so apparent. The human rights abuses, whether it's in Xinjiang or elsewhere, continue, and they have not been rolled back. And the debt diplomacy grievance, which we've seen in developing countries, is becoming more real. There are also signs that Chinese, action, Chinese ambitions are not really ready to be realised. Strength on paper when it comes to military capability is very different to what it is in a real theatre of conflict. And if anybody doubts that, just ask the Russians. Things also take time, and particularly in a country such as China, which is hard to govern. That's been proven over centuries, not just over recent decades. It is a hard place to run, and there will always be setbacks. And autocracy can be incredibly inflexible and inhibit ability to adapt to changing circumstances, despite the ambition they may hold. And also note that China has an enormous amount to lose by getting it wrong, which gives pause for thought. And the appetite for detente could be as much about securing breathing space as it is to avoid conflict. There is a, a mutually assured destruction when it comes to questions regarding Taiwan. And I don't believe everyone is prepared to risk everything in China on that issue. Supply change would seize up financial markets would panic and potentially collapse. We know that Chinese ports account for about 40% of shipping volume in the world's top 100 ports. Five, six of the largest ships transit through the Taiwan Strait. What would happen to the movement of capital, the potential impact of sanctions, would be a devastation to the Chinese economy and more so there than it would be in Western countries. Rand estimates back in 16, the conflict with the US would reduce Chinese GDP by around 25 to 35%, yet in the US of 5 to 10%. So they have a lot to lose, and the risks and stakes are incredibly high, and I think that does give pause for thought. So what do we do about it in the time, Miles, that we have remaining before we have a few questions? I think there are three things that we should do. We should stay ahead, we should stay true, and we should stay awake. Our objective should be to provide an effective counterbalance to avoid conflict, protect interests, and promote stability and improve certainty. On stay ahead, 
we must continue across the Western world to reduce our dependency on the Chinese economy. Supply chains, critical technologies, rare earths, critical minerals, trade cooperation, all of these we must continue to diversify. It's just common sense risk management. We must continue to align our resistance to coercion and other aggressive acts in the grey zone. Through multilateral cooperation or microlaterals as they're particularly called these days. We need to protect the rules-based order that favours freedom and supports market-based economies. In the standard setting uh, forums of the UN and other places, we need to be vigilant. We must protect the CPTPP. The idea that China would join this is not something that my government supported, and it's not something that many other governments I know would support and should not be. We need to understand the red zones with our partners with whom we're aligning. Those red zones have a spectrum. For some, there'll be very firm lines. For others, it will be more ambiguous. And those partners and those who we align with, we need to have an understanding of what their space is and where they're prepared to act and where they are not to ensure that we avoid any confusion. And there should be no concessions in the global trade system for state-centred economies. The idea that a leave pass should be given, whether it be on emissions reduction or having to live up to the responsibilities in our trading system, should not get a leave pass on the rather difficult uh, suggestion to maintain that one is a developing country of the size of China. If you can build aircraft carriers, you can reduce your emissions. We need to boost deterrence together and through our military cooperation, our presence and capability building, especially in cyber, quantum and AI and advanced defence technologies, which is what AUKUS was all about. A unique arrangement of its kind and one that brought, brings together probably the most trusted set of relationships anywhere in the world between Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom. We must contest the space, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, but we must give countries in the Indo-Pacific space. We should not assume that they have the similar interests or similar motivations. Just because they're our purposes and our objectives, we must respect the purposes and objectives of other countries in the Indo-Pacific. We must engage their multilaterals and we must respect those non-aligned in the region on their terms and address their interests which are principally sovereignty, security, well-being and certainty. And one of the things I was most pleased on the Prime Minister is Australia was the first country to achieve a comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN just a few days before China. Our relationship with ASEAN is one of the most important that Australia holds and we are able to achieve that because we've always respected the interests and the sovereignty of the countries that form ASEAN. We need to stay true. We need to let the West continue to be the West and not undermine our own strengths or surrender them. We need to be mindful of the emergence of neo-Marxist global justice agendas which seek to roll back the way that Western market democracies operate. The re-regulation of our market economies, the increased taxation to fund uh, the role of an expanded state. We don't overcome the threat of a very different way of looking at the world by becoming it. And that is something that Australia feels very strongly about. And I know people feel very strongly about here in the United States and I encourage them in those views. We need to get things right at home. We have our own problems. And in our own democracies and market-based economies, we need to demonstrate that we deal with those problems and we get them right. And that the light shines brightly from our own home economies. And we must be present and we must be positive and we must be helpful. And this is particularly what we were seeking to do with the Quad. Quad isn't just about any level of defence cooperation. It is broader than that. And the role we particularly played during COVID to reach out to countries, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, be it with vaccines or other support, was incredibly important. And finally, we need to stay awake. We can't get distracted. The main thing must remain the main thing. I know President Xi thinks that. He understands where these issues sit in the hierarchy of what he's dealing with. And we must be careful to ensure that it does not drift from the top of our set of interests either. 
regardless of any other issues or as important as they may be. We must set reasonable expectations and rule out what should be ruled out. Uh, there is no realistic agenda for regime that should ever regime change that should ever be pursued outside of China. That's a domestic matter for China, how it's run and who controls it. That is not a matter for others elsewhere. We must carefully engage and keep watch to avoid miscalculation. So welcome the engagement, but we should be careful about it and we should particularly be careful and transparent about any price that is being paid to ensure that contact. We should not assume that what the, China, what the Chinese population wants. We cannot be so arrogant to think that there is a similar set of issues and motivations that exist within the Chinese population that exist within the population of our own countries. The West has made this mistake before. There are very real issues and motivations which President Xi talks about with the Chinese population for which there is significant sympathy. And we should not underestimate that. And we should finally not forget who we are dealing with at the end of the day. President Xi's timetable, I believe, has a political and biological use-by date. His agenda does not have the generational patience that Deng Xiaoping's did, who saw the changes occurring over a long period of time and has brought more people out of poverty than at any other time during world history. President Xi's agenda is quite different and it's quite personal and it's one which he's highly motivated. The difference, I'd say, between President Putin and President Xi is this. President Xi believes very much in what he's doing. What we see from President Putin is more like what we'd see in a mafioso. What we see is a gang leader or a thug. What we see in President Xi is something very different, very determined, very much focused on his beliefs and his ambition for China. So let us remind ourselves who we're dealing with in his own words. He said this in his community of common destiny for mankind only four years ago. He said, just like Marx, we must struggle for communism our entire lives. A collectivist world is just there, over the horizon. Whoever rejects that world will be rejected by the world. Xi Jinping, in his own words, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. I think with a speech like that, you could run the highest office in the United States and win. <laughs> Uh, I do have a long list of questions prepared, but in the interest of time, I'm going to yeah. truncate my questions, sure. and, and then I'll give uh, as much time to the audience uh, as possible. Uh, in your speech, you, you obviously stressed the uh, importance of alliance between Australia and the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, in your opinion, what can the United States do more to engender a stronger um, bilateral relationship and to help Australia because you guys were in the front line yeah. in, in the Pacific uh, in, this, uh, in this ethics uh, struggle. Well, I think it's at the practical level. It's certainly not at the, at the political level. I mean, the political commitment to the relationship is stronger than in probably anywhere else in the world. Um, so there is certainly uh, nothing further to be done at that level. But on the practical, I think there are a couple of things. The first one is there are some real constraints, I think, to realising what we both want to achieve out of AUKUS and the UK wants to achieve out of AUKUS as well. And that really is, I think, to ensure that Australian um, defence uh, contractors and, and uh, those involved in that sector, particularly in the technology sector, are not impeded by um, some of the uh, uh, US content restrictions. Um, and that, is, that will frustrate, I think, the objectives of what we both really want to achieve. And I know those issues are raised appropriately in the right forums. I have no doubt that would be raised now in the dialogue going on in the, in the Osmin talks. I have no specific knowledge of that, um, nor should I. But uh, I know it is a matter that's constantly raised. The other thing I'd say is we've got to keep making sure the main thing is the main thing. Um, the Indo-Pacific is the, is the centre of what is occurring geopolitically around the world today. That has shifted from Europe. 
That is not to say that the, the terrible events in Ukraine don't deserve our full support, and Australia has done that, as has the US, and that should continue. Um, but uh, while there are many agendas that need to be addressed, uh, when it comes to the things that I think are going to have the biggest impact on the United States and Australia, uh, it's ensuring that we, we manage this global uh, strategic competition right, and we make sure that it sits at the top of our, of our list of issues that we're, we're seeking to address together. Great, great. Uh, so um, uh, the Chinese strategy, one of the strategies is to blame everything that's going, going wrong in the world on the United States. Mm. So, um, so that's why they single U.S. out for all this uh, uh, trouble China is particularly in. Obviously, we understand that's wrong yeah. because the China challenge is not just the U.S.-China uh, woes. Mm. It's also a global challenge. Uh, in that regard, uh, there is a global alliance of some sort. Um, uh, there are different kind of alliance systems mm. going on. Um, your country were heavily involved under your leadership mm. uh, with the two of them at least, Quad and AUKUS. Mm. And you mentioned in your speech about mm. Australia's uh, relationship with the ASEAN countries. Yeah. Is there anything beyond that? For example, NATO and uh, Taiwan, Japan, so South Korea, those are much broader scope. Do you envision any of the possibilities of uh, a bigger alliance system? Uh, well, I, I, I prefer to use the word alignment. Alignment. Okay. Alignment. I think the, the, the formality of alliances can often um, slow things down in achieving the cooperation which is necessary. And, the, you know, there are, there are very real political challenges with, you know, forming alliances with some of the countries you've mentioned because of historical issues between some of them. So that's a challenge. And you can get past that, I think, by greater alignment. I, I thought... Um, uh, Prime Minister Johnson's initiative in Carvis Bay was outstanding, mm -hmm. um, where he engaged a number of other major Western democracies, ourselves, India, uh, Korea and South Africa, uh, in what was a G7 plus dialogue. And it was at that dialogue, at his invitation, where I read out the 14 points, where I highlighted uh, what we were dealing with and how that required a greater alignment between the countries that sat around that table and more beyond. Um, so I think that is how you can pursue a lot of that. Um, there is already a, a, a network of bilateral and minilateral and multilateral arrangements between a lot of those countries. And I think what an alignment does is give greater focus. A good example is how those countries should be working together when it comes to key standards boards within the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And during my time, we made that a priority in working with other countries. Australia um, went on to uh, take out the Secretary Generalship of the OECD. Um, but there were other initiatives where we were supporting other um, like-minded countries for other positions. Now, China has been fairly uh, uh, passionate about how it's pursued a number of these key agenda-setting agencies. And uh, this won't make headlines, but it is incredibly important, particularly in the technology space and telecommunications space, um, that the standard setting, which can be achieved there, can have real implications for how the rest of the world works. So that alignment, I think, Miles, is what we have to focus on, and that's drawing more and more people together um, to be aware of these issues and the actions they can take together. Yeah. I think your uh, common alliance or alignment, mm. as you prefer, mm. um, obviously uh, comes from a common sense of threat. Mm. challenges. Mm. And I think your non-Wilsonian 14 points mm. uh, actually <laughs> could, should uh, constantly remind us uh, as of what we're facing uh, together. Mm. So um, I'm going to basically stop my question of, uh, uh, and, and I'm going to basically ask questions from the audience. Um, so uh, great. Let's see. Um, in a 2020 strategic defense policy update, mm. you mentioned the acquisition of long-range strike capabilities to hold adversaries' mm. infrastructure at risk. Mm. What exactly were they thinking of? Well, I don't want to elaborate too much, and I think these things become more self-evident. Uh, but what was clear in that um, defence strategic update, that's where I said that Australia was now dealing with a period in the world's history which was not unlike what was experienced in the 1930s. Um, but I went on to stress that it didn't have to have the same outcome and I didn't think it would. Um, but that didn't mean that we should be naive about this, the pressures that were mounting. Um, and for Australia's defence interests, what has changed has been a, a more acute focus on the Indo-Pacific, 
and, and the more direct threats that uh, we are exposed to. And to achieve that, you need the capabilities that enable you to keep potential adversaries as far away from Australia as you possibly can. Um, and that obviously um, meant uh, an increased focus on our naval and uh, our naval and our, our aerial capabilities, and uh, whether it's you know, things that we've done with JSFs or what the work we're doing um, with partners when it comes to long-range capabilities. Um, these are the these are the real focus of those partnerships now. Um, whereas before, our force was uh, seeking to do many things in many places. Uh, our force now is much more focused on uh, the threats that are much more apparent within our own region and uh, developing real skills and capabilities in each of those. Now, um, the uh, development, this was in 2020. Now, the, the AUKUS arrangement um, we were working on even at that time and uh, obviously having a capability, a submarine capability that uh, enabled us to do things well into the future was, was critical to that. Okay, great. The follow-up on that question. Um, obviously, there's a lot of technological uh, mutual cooperation. Mm. AUKUS is a good example. Mm. Um, there's a, a, a lot of common defense strategy mm. and agreements. Do you think, in your opinion, uh, that there should be a much stronger uh, military operational interoperability between, say, uh, United States, Australia, and the U.S. and Japan? Well, between Australia and the United States, it would be difficult to imagine something even greater than we have now. I mean, it is already at a, a very high level. And what AUKUS was about um, was more not so much at the operational end, because that is already very strong, joint exercises, training, capability development, all of this sort of thing is, is, is already present and is the, and is the product of, of decades of tremendous work of so many governments of, of all stripes. Mm -hmm. um, what AUKUS was about was about the front ending uh, and the front end cooperation on both identifying the defence technology um, needs and the development of the capability to um, acquire, uh, design, construct and implement. And whether it's on AI or many other areas, uh, cyber and so on, it was about having that partnership right at the front end talking about the very issues we're trying to contend with together as very trusted partners and then how collaboratively, um, where needed, each of the, the countries could play a role in the development of those capabilities. Yeah. Uh, what I was referring to actually is a much larger context, just not between the United States and Australia, right. but also US and Australia maybe take a lead to expand what we already have, say, Malabar. Or, right. or RIMPAC, uh, yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, to involve more countries in the region yeah, yeah. to involve inter, uh, uh, operationally and to integrate uh, their capabilities. Well, I think the key player there is Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a real shift, I think, in Japan uh, about the appetite for developing these capabilities and to be working with others. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, I think there has to be some patience in allowing Japan to, to just go through their normal processes, you, you, you wouldn't want to get ahead of this. But uh, from my recent visit there, which was after I stepped down as Prime Minister after the last election, um, I sensed a very strong move in that direction, both mm -hmm. in the, the broader population and the polity, as well as at a political level within the government. So um, I think that's the path they're on. Um, and for all the same reasons that Australia and the United States have the partnership that we have, and so Japan is an obvious uh, partner. I mean, when I was Prime Minister, we put in place the first reciprocal access agreement with, with Japan. It was the first one that Japan had completed with any other nation, um, which enabled our forces to be in each other's countries and train together and so on. Uh, and this took several years to complete. It was a very complicated a agreement, um, which was done over three Prime Ministers from um, the late Shinzo Abe um, uh, through to Prime Minister Kishida and, of course, uh, Prime Minister uh, Suga. Okay, great. Uh, so next question is, uh, what advice would you give to leaders in the Indo-Pacific who may wish to speak out against the CCP's coercion but fear grey zone retaliation? Well, I think this goes to... and, and So I, I wouldn't certainly offer any public advice for one because I, I think that would go against the principle I outlined about respecting the space uh, of... Uh, of countries, particularly within ASEAN, 
Um, I think ASEAN countries are very, are, are, are very aware of the tensions within the region and the threats to their own interests. And countries like Australia and the United States and Japan have to be respectful of that. There are things that we can say and do and can, and we should consider ourselves uh, very fortunate that we can do so. Other countries in the region do not have the same uh, ability to do that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not, uh, be careful how I say this, but that doesn't mean that they don't have some similar concerns. But they have to manage those in their own way. And Australia, I think, has always been respectful of that. And I think that's the right way to approach it. The same is true in the Southwest Pacific, where I mean, what matters to countries in, in, in ASEAN, and for that matter, the Southwest Pacific, is you must respect their sovereignty. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, so uh, the uh, next question is specifically referring to defending against CCP's infiltration mm. in universities. Mm. What advice would you give to those who wish to take serious action but fear being accused of discrimination? In Australia? In Australia, yeah. Oh, stand up. I mean, honestly. Um, what, what's occurring there um, is quite obvious, I think, to most Australians now. And I don't think it's in the interests of those institutions or their students, and particularly the Australian students who are there. Um, I mean, these are supposed to be Australian places of learning, Australian places based on Australian values and Australia's outlook. Um, there's nothing wrong with the contestability of ideas, but at the same time, you don't hand over one of your most important institutions to be infiltrated um, by the sort of um, you know, ideologies which uh, you know, Confucius Institutes and things of that nature are seeking to export all around the world. Um, and uh, so I think you have to be very mindful of that. And uh, I think universities in Australia um, need to be greater defenders and protectors of those values within their own corridors and within their own classrooms. Here, here. Uh, so, uh China launched a cascading series of economic punishments mm. and diplomatic insults against Australia, mm. which only hardens the resolve of your government and nation. Yet, they keep escalating. Was it just revengefulness, or did they have a strategy behind it? Well, only they can answer the question about how vengeful it was. Um, the practical effect is the same, whether it was vengeful or not. Um, but... The difference for Australia, I mean, there, whether it's what's happening in Ukraine or what's happening with, with China, one of the things that I was careful to point out right at the start of um, the conflict in Ukraine was the very ambiguous position of China mm -hmm. and the, what that really meant. And I remember calling out one particular day that when, when the world was applying sanctions on Russia, China was very happily loading up on Russian wheat. Now, that has a, an impact for Australia. And uh, I pointed this out. And the fact that at the recent G20, China could not bring itself to join with other countries in condemning what was happening in Ukraine should be very telling. And this is what worries me about many Western countries who continue to pursue a, a very... Um, ambitious program with China, while at the same time realising the downside of what has happened when they've done that with Russia, um, I find confusing. And so when this, I make the point about alignment of supply chains in this new world, um, it was Prime Minister Modi who talked about supply chains are no longer uh, just about cost, they're about trust. And that trust takes on a dimension now which we haven't seen for some time. You must have trusted supply chains. That means you need to price in the risk of doing business in countries that have a very, very different worldview uh, when it comes to issues that are central to your own country's national interest. Um, that is, that is, should be a, fu a fundamental part of pricing in business. Uh, so. You know, they, will, they will impose their sanctions. And for Australia, standing up to China, of course, that, that carried great risk. Standing up to Russia over Ukraine was of less of a risk to Australia because our exposure to Russia is very limited. Um, but standing up to China was very different. And I will forever be grateful 
to the Australian people for the extraordinary support they showed to me um, and to my government over that period of time. And no Australian leader should ever doubt how strongly Australians feel about this. Sure, we want to have trade. We want to work with other countries. That's all fine. But we will always be conscious of what that cost is, not just in economic terms. Absolutely. I think a similar situation is, uh, has happened in the United States as well. Yeah. You know, we are also uh, very much dependent on Chinese economy, Chinese market, Chinese, mm. uh, 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 you know, uh, their manufacturing capabilities. Yeah. Uh, but we uh, consider the cost, consider the ultimate sacrifice we have to make if we don't take a uh, decisive action. So I think in the, the, the issue here obviously has reached a point of a national consensus, being how partisan this country has become. Yeah. Uh, national politics, but on China is almost unanimous. Um, yeah. Our Congress passed uh, all the China-related yeah. acts with virtually unanimous, with virtual unanimous votes. So I think we see this. Uh, there's a global awakening to the China challenge, which is a uh, much more um, substantial and much more subterranean and existential. So uh, I think you're right about that, Miles. And, and two good examples. I mean, across two different administrations. Most recently, the decision of the Biden administration on semiconductors. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Outstanding. But prior to that with the previous administration, you know, which Mike, the, my, my, the two Mikes and of course um, President Trump and the strong position they took in, in relation to China on trade, um, I think that demonstrates that across, across the aisle. And it's important that that be maintained and it's important that 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 same level of commitment is maintained in Australia. I mean, the position of the, the Liberal and National parties in Australia on these issues are very clear, and it, uh, it strikes me that that is being maintained. Uh, different language may be used, but I certainly hope it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When I was working at the State Department uh, mm. in Secretary Pompeo's office, we often, we don't receive a lot of criticism on our China policy. Mm. Occasionally, we received our, uh, some, um, some complaints, mostly from the uh, Democratic side, that, they thought we were not tough enough. Um, hello. Yeah. <laughs> so um, um, I think, uh, um, thank you very much. In the interest of time, I promise yeah. we're going to end it on time. And I think, you know, we, uh, we, um, we thank you for your wonderful uh, presence today. Thanks, Mark. And uh, um, hopefully this uh, U.S.-Australian relationship will continue and deepen. Yeah. And uh, so as a token of uh, gratitude, China Center at Hudson, Cent uh, at Hudson Institute will give you a small gift, which is a, uh, <laughs> uh, a mug with a Winnie the Pooh on it. Yeah. And uh, it's wonderful if you drink Australian wine with it. Okay. <laughs> very good. Well, that is intriguing. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, great. And thank you for your uh, and uh, the event is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.